good afternoon and thank you for the invitation to give a quick presentation for the agronomy seed farm field day. My preference would be uh, to be standing in a field and discussing kind of how things look and how things went for our, the last few years on some variety data. Love to show you how the breeding nurseries look in the program. Um, and I, you know, the supper is always pretty good too, but we'll have to use our imaginations until next year, unfortunately. This is kind of an interesting opportunity to be able to give a virtual presentation though, because I think what it does is it allows me to show you uh, some of the data, some of the visualizations that I would be using to make the presentation that I would give were I in the field um, and be able to see this on a screen in a way that you couldn't see uh, on the wagons on the tour. What we're looking at here uh, is, this is three year data. These are a comparison of yield on the X axis here. So higher yield to the right, lower yield to the left and protein on the Y axis. And with again, higher protein um, going to the, to the top left hand corner here and lower protein down here. So in general, what, we're, what we really see is what we would expect, which is a pretty general negative relationship between yield and protein. And this is no surprise, right? Higher yielding lines tend to have lower protein, lower yielding lines tend to have higher protein. That doesn't, that shouldn't be uh, any big shock. But what we do see when we look at a figure like this is our lines that potentially uh, are above average for multiple traits. So if you go across here and you find the point where zero and zero intersect, right about here, that's the average for yield and for protein. And by the way, why are we talking about yield numbers that range from negative 10 to 10 and protein that goes from negative two and a half to two? Well, these are actually, these are not protein percentage and yield in bushels per acre. These are what's called best linear unbiased predictions for these traits. Um, if you are familiar at all with livestock, this is the same approach that we would use to calculate um, estimated breeding values or the EPDs, the estimated progeny differences in cattle. So if you're looking at a bull catalog, those numbers um, are very similar to what you would get uh, for, for the blups for these two traits that we're showing here. Now the average of this group of genotypes is centered about zero. So this point right here where I've marked the X, anything higher than that X going this direction has higher than average protein. Everything to the right of this X going this way has higher than average yield. So things that are outside of the normal trend for yield and protein would be things that fall in this quadrant of the graph here. Up here in the top left, that's low yield, high protein. Low yield, low protein, that'd be a really bad news down here in the bottom left. And then some of your more, what we might call racehorse varieties that have high yield and low protein are found in the bottom right. So the quadrant we wanna be in is high yield, high protein. And so what we've got are a handful of lines that over the 2017 to 19 data, um, they suggest that they might be a little bit different than the average for these traits. And actually that should include uh, laying them in here. We should, the circle should have been broadened to include it. So what do we have now? Well, we have things that, as we said, have high yield, low protein. Does that mean they're bad quality? Not necessarily, but it's difficult to get a good loaf of bread out of a low protein wheat. Um, and what we find when we do our functionality tests in the milling and baking lab is that a lot of the things that fall down in this quadrant are sometimes difficult to use for the end use products that our customers expect. We've got some things kind of hovering in the middle here, HRS 3100, uh, which that would be CP 3100, AP Murdoch, Surpass. Those are around average protein with high yield, might be worth taking a look at. 
And then the things that are in this, as we said, quadrant here with the high yield, high protein, uh, th there's a pretty decent chance that those will have um, okay milling and baking quality along with good yield for the these locations, which is, again, specific to this Castleton area here. So what else is important in selecting a variety? Well, we'll come back to the quality on these. Bacterial leaf streak and fusarium head blight are the two diseases that I would say, especially in this area, um, I would be paying the most attention to. And the best resource to find the most up-to-date information on these lines is the annual variety trial results and variety selection guide that we release around October every year. That's going to have the most current disease data and the most current quality and also the agronomic data from that year as well as those three-year averages. So bacterial leaf streak, what we're starting to see with some preliminary data is that seven is the tipping point. If you're higher than a seven on that BLS scale that we, we produce, you're looking at some potential for some very serious yield loss in an environment where BLS is present. Um, anything lower than that, you're not as bad off. If you're lower than four, four or less, um, I would say that in most cases, you're going to be in pretty good shape because those lines stood up to some pretty heavy pressure last year and exhibited a pretty high level of genetic resistance. So if you can find it, four or less is great. Stay out of that seven or higher and you should be okay. Fusarium head blight. There's a lot of things grouped in the five and six. Everything sort of looks like it's kind of the same. Um, and to a large extent, that's because with enough pressure, uh, a lot of varieties will perform similarly. If you can grow a four um, on this scale, I would highly encourage it. Those are the most likely to stand up to the disease without necessarily needing fungicide. Greater than a seven is putting you at a very high risk in, an, in a year with a uh, conducive environment. And those fives and sixes, you're going to want to monitor your risk. Uh, you're going to want to check the scab forecasting models, look at things around uh, that, that head emergence time and make a decision based on your risk factors there and, and the potential of your crop. But those are kind of the boundaries that I would use for those two diseases. So with that in mind, take a look and see some of these things that are standouts for uh, yield and protein may not necessarily be uh, the best for some of these diseases. Um, however, because this data is from a trial uh, that has trials that were largely exposed to these pathogens, generally speaking, um, if, if the disease has a really big impact on yield, we're going to see it in these results. So check that guide, keep an eye on the, the disease resistance that you've got there and make a decision where your risk level is going to be for those two in particular. Um, and from there, I think it's also important that we just mentioned briefly the end use quality. So if you've heard me talk before, you know that end use quality is a big deal in our program. Um, frankly, if it weren't for the quality of spring wheat, um, our prices would be even worse than they are now, which I know for some of you might be hard to imagine. Um, stay out of the areas of things that have very poor end use quality if you can afford to. Um, those hurt the overall marketability of, of the wheat that we grow in our region. Um, and it, it's very apparent to uh, wheat buyers abroad when we have a crop that has a large influence of some of these varieties with poor quality. So we publish a lot of quality data. What are the three columns that you would look at if you could only look at three? Freenograph absorption, which is a measure of water absorption capacity in the flower. The freenograph stability, which is a measure of the dough strength. And the loaf volume, which is the, um, the physical measurement for the miniature loaves of bread that are made from these varieties. And we want high numbers for all three of these categories. So when we start to get into trouble is when we have a line that has, you know, multiple strikes against it for end use quality. An example of this is our racehorse LCS trigger down here. Um, it often has very low wheat protein levels. 
um, and very poor quality scores along with that, a low stability, a very poor low volume. Um, this is a wheat that, you know, I would really think twice about because I think you can get some things that have um, still very competitive yield potentials um, in the area of, of this graph in particular. Anything right in this category here, you're going to have pretty strong exceptional yield potential on. And there are some things in here that don't have as poor of milling and baking quality. So check this guide. Um, look at the things that sort of fall around these averages or slightly higher than average. Um, AP Murdoch is one to keep your eye on. We've only baked a few locations of this line, but the early indications are that it has a nice combination of yield and end use quality. Um, SY Valda is a little bit lower than average for absorption, not so bad for stability. The low volume can be a little poor. Um, this is one that, as many of you know, the protein can get a little low on if the yield is high. Um, not the best quality, but uh, there are a lot worse decisions you could make. Um, MN Torgi is a recent release from the Minnesota program with uh, pretty good stability, pretty fair absorption. Um, the low volume in the data from the, our initial sites last year wasn't as good, uh, but 2019 was a difficult year for, for getting really strong data. Um, CP3939 uh, is one that has, uh, in those initial tests, um, pretty good quality across the board. And as you can see, also falls into that high yield um, and high protein quadrant of our graph here. So there are things out there that, that buck the trend for um, necessarily having low yield just because they have strong quality or strong protein. And I would really encourage you to take a look at the data that we produce in, in the fall of this year and look at those factors that are important to you and try to consider um, where your where your uh, priorities are on your farm and keeping the you know the overall market class in mind. The one thing I forgot to mention on this figure here is that the dots are color coded by straw strength. So a more blue is a uh, stronger straw. More red uh, has had more problems with lodging over the past three years, uh, with sort of the gray being in the middle. Um, we haven't had, uh, last year we had good lodging data. The previous years in the sites around here, the data wasn't as strong, but um, depending on where your, where your risk is, is there, um, I would be looking in the blue to gray for sure uh, and staying away from things that are colored red. Uh, these are, are lines that have had issues with standability um, over the past few years, particularly in 2019. So if you've got questions about varieties and you want to talk about any of this type of data, if you'd like to see some of these types of manipulations, um, or you've got questions about interpreting the quality data, give me a call. If you want to talk about how things are going in the program, um, I'd love to hear from you. My information is listed on the NDSU webpage. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your field season. Mm -hmm.